This is the pre-lab video for the laboratory experiment Mendeleev for a day, in which you're going to be taking nine different chemical solutions. So a solution is going to be a chemical compound that's dissolved in water, so it's a mixture. You can't see that compound because it's already dissolved. And your task is going to be based on observations of chemical reactions to classify and categorize these nine different solutions into a couple of different groupings based on similar patterns in their reactivity. So what you're gonna be doing is there'll be in the room nine different burettes, each containing the a solution. So they'll be numbered one, two, et cetera, all the way to number nine. Each of these solutions is gonna be uh, colorless, and clear so you can identify it based on the physical characteristics of the solution alone. What you're going to need to do according to your lab is first of all you're going to be using all your test tubes in your drawer to really test these different solutions. Uh, practicing good chemical hygiene is going to be very important to su success in this lab so you want to make sure your test tubes are good and clean and that's going to mean rinsing them liberally with deionized water using your test tube brush to really get in there and clean them out, and then really rinsing well in between unknowns. Now, while you don't know what the solutions are, you will be seeing some fairly common chemical reactions to the test solutions. Okay. So what, now that I know I've got it nice and clean, doesn't have to be dry, just has to be very clean, I'm gonna to go to the burette, and again, it doesn't matter which of the nine you start with. You can start with one, you could start with seven, that doesn't really matter. And then the way the burette works is you're going to put the test tube just underneath the tip of this burette. And right now it's closed, the valve, in this case it's blue, some of them are orange or red, it's at a perpendicular position to the body of the burette, so that's closed. If I go ahead and open this valve by turning it slowly, I can get some dripping of the solution into my test tube, or eventually I will get a full stream, okay? So what you're trying to do is get roughly about half a milliliter for this. Now when you're reading these, half a milliliter, okay, the numbers are gonna increase as you go down. It's gonna be, it doesn't have to be a precise measurement. So about half a milliliter looks like about that much of a test tube. So it's not really a whole lot of liquid that we're talking about here. Probably about maybe a centimeter, etc. Okay, so this you keep track of what you have. Okay, do that for a number of different test tubes. You're going to need a total of three. So you don't have to measure the second one. Again, make sure that they're clean. Just get it to approximately the same volume of liquid. So each of these test tubes I'm filling with about half a milliliter of the same solution. So I have three tubes that are roughly the same right now, okay? Then each of these tubes is going to be used for a different test. So I'll use one of these for test solution A. You add the, the required number of drops of solution A. Shake gently. Notice that I'm shaking that just by moving my hands to mix the contents and then record any observations. Did a precipitate form? And we know a precipitate forms if it turns cloudy. Remember, a precipitate indicates that you formed a solid by mixing two liquids together. Also, if it does form a precipitate on your lab data table, you'll want to indicate what color it is. That might be an important detail. So we're going to test one with solution A. Your second test tube will test with solution B. And your third test tube, you're going to test with solution C. Again, we're recording any kind of change that we see, okay? Now, test solution D only applies to test tubes that you've tested already with A and B. So this is my solution A, this is my test solution B in here. If any of them form a precipitate, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and add a couple drops of test solution D. Now, if both of them form a precipitate, I'm gonna add D to both of them and record if anything changes. If neither of them have a precipitate, I don't add any D. Or if one has precipitate, you add it to that, but not to the one that didn't precipitate. So only to precipitates are we gonna add test solution D, okay? 
So I'm going to do that and record my observations for the test solutions A, B, C, and D. Now for this lab, these chemicals that we're working with in these solutions and some of the test solutions, most of them are safe to go down the drain, but not all of them are. Uh, for example, test solution A, unknown solution 2, 4, and 9 are not safe to go down the drain. And your teacher will provide you with a waste container to pour these into, either a large jug, flask, etc. And anything that has solution A, 2, and 4, and 9 has to go in those uh, waste bins. Um, after you've poured the content of the test tube into those bins, you can rinse that test tube and the rinsings can go down the drain. They don't have to go into the waste bottle just because you rinse that particular liquid out. Um, again, make sure you rinse really well your test tubes in between. One of the things you might encounter is when you get a tube that you thought was clean and you're at the burette and you're putting in your half a milliliter and you realize it changed color or it already precipitated. That wasn't supposed to happen because you haven't added a test solution yet. What that means is your test tubes are contaminated. It means they're not cleaned enough. So that means, yes, go back, do more rinsing, do more scrubbing with a test tube brush, rinse again more with deionized water. When you're all done with the lab, again, wash up all of your equipment, your hands you want to wash exceptionally well. Um, given the toxicity of solutions A, 2, 4, and 9, we absolutely do not have food or drink when we're working in the lab setting. And we don't uh, eat or drink until after you've washed your hands very well with water. Once you're done with the lab, your task is going to be to take your data and categorize those nine solutions into groupings, much like it was done with the periodic table of the elements. What you're going to want to do then is take those elements or those substances, look for commonalities, and you're going to end up with between two and five different groups. So notice I didn't get, tell you how many different groups there are between two and five. These groups have to have at least two different solutions in them. So for example, you can't have a group with only test solution number seven in it. That doesn't follow in the rules. So again, between two and five groups, and every group has to have at least two different unknown solutions in them.